Lots of questions to answer on today's show. Is Chet Holmgren a future NBA superstar? Will Andrew Nembhard be in Indiana's backup point guard? Will Philip Petrusev and Joel Ayayi earn NBA contracts? All of that, as well as a look at what happens next with the Pac-12 following the Big 12's decision not to merge together, what it could mean for Gonzaga, all right here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. I'd also like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we're talking Summer League today for Zags, of course, participating in NBA Summer League action this year. The two rookies, Chet Holmgren and Andrew Nembhard, we'll talk about them first. And then segment two, we're talking about the other veteran guys in Joel Iai and Philip Petrusa, of course, trying to find themselves on an NBA roster to begin the season. We'll start with Chet. Uh, Chet finished up Summer League. He did not play in Oklahoma City's last game against Golden State. There was an opportunity for him to potentially face off against James Wiseman, who was the number two overall pick a few years ago. Young, exciting, big prospects. Some similarities to Chet in some ways. I would have been cool to get to see those two guys match up for 15, 20 minutes per night. Uh, but unfortunately, Oklahoma City made the decision to rest Chet to keep him out for the final few games to not risk injury. It's a decision we saw a lot of teams make throughout the summer league. Obviously, Paolo Bancaro got shut down before his opportunity to face Chet. Uh, if there was a knock for summer league, on it was just that Chet didn't get those matchups, and that's not his fault necessarily. I mean, it's not his fault at all. It's not his fault that Bancaro and the Orlando Magic decided not to play in that game. It's not his fault that Oklahoma City held him out against James Wiseman. Would have been nice to see him go up against some of those guys. We still did get to see him with opportunities against talented NBA players, but most of his best performances came against guys who are not exactly NBA rotation players. Taco Fall, who I think is a guy who could definitely play consistent minutes in the NBA, but just hasn't hasn't done that yet. Kofi Coburn, you know, another guy who hasn't really stuck or who hasn't had a chance to stick in the NBA and isn't really expected to. Uh, he got – he – Played against Keegan Murray, who's going to definitely be an NBA player. Keegan Murray finished with the Summer League MVP. Had 29 points in that game against Oklahoma City and Chet Holmgren. It wasn't really Chet's fault. In fact, they specifically changed his defensive assignment to get him to work on some other stuff. We saw him playing more defense away from the rim. He wasn't just underneath the basket blocking shots. He was kind of demonstrating that ability to be a switchable big, to play up away from the rim, to play the passing lanes, do all that stuff. I thought it was a nice performance from Chet. It was his last game, but... He also only had eight points in that game, and so a lot of people are going to look at the box score. See, Keegan Murray, who went number four overall, had 29 points. Chet Holmgren, who went number two overall, had eight points and are going to make their assumptions off of that. That's generally the group of people who uh, are actively rooting for Chet Holmgren to not succeed. There seems to be a, a fair amount of people out there uh, in that camp. They wouldn't tell you that. They're going to say that, ah, I think he should have uh, done this. I think he's too, you know, whatever it may be, but there's a group that really is, is struggling to, to want to root for Chet Holmgren for reasons that are a little bit beyond me. I understand that sports fandom kind of just lends itself to, to that kind of thing, but uh, Chet did everything right pretty much in this summer league there. You know, he's not perfect. He's not a perfect basketball player. He's not going to come in and be an MVP or even an all-star in year one, but he, he did what was asked of him. He said, I want to go out. I want to be a 50, 40, 90 guy. Want to shoot 50% from the field, want to shoot 40% from three, want to shoot 90 plus percent from the free throw line. He did that in Summer League. He proved he's capable of doing that. Again, Summer League, not the NBA. There is a difference there. And do I think he's going to go out and be 50, 40, 90 right away in the NBA? Not necessarily, but he could. <laughs> he's good enough. He's talented enough that if he gets the right looks, if he's getting open threes, if Shaq Gilgis Alexander, Josh Giddy are able to get him in opportunities, where he can finish well around the rim. He's a you know, rim runner, alley-oop guy, uh, can also get some open looks for three off pick and pops. Like 
he's a guy who could easily do this pretty much right out of the shoots or at least come very, very close to it. Obviously a full NBA game, 82 game NBA schedule is tough and you're going to wear down by the end of it. And so there could be some, some struggles towards the end of the season for Chet, but overall his summer league performance showed exactly what you want out of a number two overall pick, what you want out of a guy that you're planning to rebuild your team around. He can be the focal point on offense. He can do the, you know, step back three pointers, the crossover dribbles. He can take guys off the dribble. He can, post guys up he can score in many different ways but he can also be more of a a role piece a complementary piece where he doesn't need the ball in his hands a lot to score I think that does separate him a little bit from some of the other guys in this draft class who I think are a little bit more ball dominant in some ways Holmgren's not a ball dominant guy he's obviously incredibly impactful on the defensive end of the floor which is his biggest skill set but he's also not a guy that you need to get him x number of touches per game in order for him to be effective he can only get a few touches a game and just score his points off offensive rebounds, off putbacks, off uh, just catch and shoot threes where he doesn't need the ball all that much. Like I think there's there's a lot of reasons to be really really excited about Chet Holmgren. Uh, he still had some turnover issues in in summer league. He turned the ball over close to three times per game. Turnover numbers, particularly in summer league, are not something to take super seriously. But Chet Holmgren also turned the ball over a fair amount of times at Gonzaga. Uh, just ball security, something to work on a little bit. Um, I think he he's he's good at knowing when to make the right pass, and we've seen him make some very excellent passers uh, in summer league and at Gonzaga. But I think sometimes he just doesn't quite execute the pass all that well. He sees the guy and he just overthrows him or doesn't make a good pass or sees it a second too late and the defender steps in. Those are things that are going to get corrected. If that's the biggest nitpick that we can have on Chet Holmgren through his first five games in the summer league, then it's hard to, to be too concerned. Uh, he did get bodied by some bigger guys, but again, I think guys he generally won't guard in the NBA, which is why it's not something that I'm overly concerned about. I think he's going to be great. I think he's going to be a superstar. I'm, I'm firmly in the camp that he's going to be very, very good. Not right away. I don't want people to be talking to me like, in January or February and being like, well, he's not a superstar yet. Like, come on, it's going to take a while. He's very young. Uh, he, five years from now, he was going to be like 24, 25. Like he, he's still reaching what could be the potential here. He's got a long ways to go, but uh, the early returns have been very, very solid for Chet Holmgren. All right, moving on. I want to talk about Andrew Nemhard with the Indiana Pacers here. Uh, Nemhard played five games with Indiana. He averaged about 26 minutes per night. Uh, average six and a half points, five assists, four boards, and just under one steal per game. Uh, the good news for Nemhart, he did not miss a single free throw. He looked excellent from the charity stripe there. Uh, he obviously played big minutes, 26 minutes per night in the summer league is fantastic. Uh, it's not surprising guys in that second round range are, are probably the most likely players to play a lot in summer league because teams are invested in them. They really want to see them succeed. They want to make sure that their second round pick is a guy that can and will contribute to them as soon as year one, but also first round guys tend to get rested a little bit more late second round guys are undrafted guys. There's less security for them. So less of an opportunity to really play them big minutes. Teams would rather look at other guys, which is why Nempart ends up being one of the biggest minutes per game guy throughout the summer league. Uh, he did a little bit of everything. Obviously five assists, four boards per game is fantastic. Uh, didn't do a ton of scoring, which is not going to be his biggest strength in the NBA, but we saw him look very comfortable running the offense. His skip passes are phenomenal. That's one of his best skills and his ability to, he may not be this fastest guy on the court, which is not you is kind of unusual for a point guard, but he gets the ball up the court really, really fast. I think he is somebody who can be effective as a fast break opportunity, even if he's not, you know, just blowing. He's not Meech, you know, he's not Rasir Bolton, even he's not blowing past guys, but he can get the ball up the court in a hurry. Uh, he's willing to push the pace. We saw him do that against Memphis for the Zags, and, and I know he can do that with Indiana. Uh, he made some highlight reel passes, not just the skip passes. He had a great no look pass to Kendall Brown of Baylor. If you guys haven't seen the highlight on that, it's on, uh, it's all over Twitter, all over YouTube, a fantastic play by Nemhard. Uh, the bad news for him, uh, turnovers were a little high. Again, the same caveat applies turnovers, summer league, five game sample, eh, not something that I would be overly concerned about, but that is one of Nemhard's like biggest strengths. One of his biggest calling cards coming out of the draft was, Hey, this is a guy who is great in the pick and roll. He makes really good decisions. He doesn't turn the ball over. So for Indiana, like, that's what you need to see out of him. If he's going to start turning the ball over a lot more, that's going to be a problem. Do I, th I don't think that that's going to happen. 
I'm not worried about that necessarily for Andrew Nempard, but the numbers were a little bit inflated in summer league. And it's something that I'm sure the staff and the team are, are working with like, Hey, here are some ways to maybe el- eliminate some of these turnovers uh, that we saw from you in the summer league. I also struggled a little bit to finish around the rim. Uh, again, the, the offense, the shooting at least just wasn't, wasn't great. He didn't finish particularly well around the rim. He only shot three of 14 from deep. Very small sample size there. You just you tack on two or three more makes, and all of a sudden that percentage is way, way better. Uh, so, again, not something to be overly concerned about. But, again, the three-point shooting, we haven't seen it consistently from Nembhard really ever. He was an okay three-point shooter at Florida, uh, and then he kind of devolved into being not a great three-point shooter. His first year at Gonzaga, he was barely over 30%. And then he was good last year, but, again, it took him a while. He, he started out the year very slow. And then he kind of got really, really hot for a nice stretch, and that kind of kept his overall season numbers pretty high. But for large chunks of of Nembhard's collegiate career, he was not a great three-point shooter. So that's a skill that's going to need to be there. I mean, there's, there's there's no way around it. Like, you could do everything else really well, but if you cannot knock down an open three to the point where defenses do not have to guard you out there, that nothing else really matters. Like you have to be, you'd have to be otherworldly athletically uh, or like 6'10 in order for the three point shooting to not be an issue. And so for Nembhard, he's going to need to get there. I think he can. I think he will. But he's going to, he, I mean, it's, it's something that needs to happen. Like that is a clear step that needs to happen between now and when he becomes a legitimate, you know, 10, 15, 20 minute per game backup point guard in the NBA. That's, that's a, a, a realistic path. For Nempard, maybe not right away necessarily. It kind of depends what happens happens with Indiana this offseason and into the season. But again, like the, the three point shooting needs to be there in order for him to get there. Are right, we going to come back in the second segment? We're going to do the same exact thing with Gonzaga's two other performers in the NBA Summer League. That is, of course, Joel Ayayi and Philip Petrusev. Before we get there, though, I want to tell you all about LinkedIn. As the sun comes out and small businesses are back in business, LinkedIn Jobs makes it easier to grow your team. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the people you want to interview faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Did you know that every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zags. And if you've ever wondered which NFL stars move the betting line the most, starting on July 18th, Locked On gives you the 50 most valuable players in the NFL from the odds makers at Bet Online. Available July 18th on Locked On NFL, wherever you get your podcasts. All right, we are talking Atlanta Hawks guard Joel Ayayi and Philadelphia 76ers big man Philip Petrusev, former Zags here performing, fighting for their NBA careers during summer league this year. We'll start with Joel Ayayi. Ayayi played five games for the Atlanta Hawks. He averaged just about 21 minutes per game. In that time, he averaged 5.2 points, 5.8 rebounds, 2.4 assists, and 1.4 steals per game. I talked a little bit about Joel on Monday's episode, the mailbag episode. We had a question about Joel. Uh, I'm planning to do a, a video breakdown article of Joel Iai. Uh, I don't want to make a specific promise on when, but hopefully in the next week or so, uh, that'll be out on my website, scorezagscore.com, so people can check that out as well. Uh, the good news for Joel are the same skill sets that have kind of helped him get to where he is. He moves extremely well without the basketball. There is a reason that Hunter Salas watched videotape of Joel Iai last season to learn how to be how to kind of be crafty, how to cut to the rim at the right time, how to make those decisions, how to kind of do that. Because again, one of the best things that you can be in the NBA is a guy who can contribute without needing the ball in his hands. There's a lot of really good ball dominant players in the NBA. Every team has them. You're talking about Atlanta. Trey Young is a very prominent example of that. You want players around that kind of guy who 
can be impactful, either defensively impactful from beyond the arc or just find ways to impact the game without needing to, you know, take 10 seconds to take their man and do a bunch of dribbles and, and make actions off of that. You don't teams don't need a bunch of guys like that. They only need one or two guys like that. Joel is great at not being that guy, but what he needs to prove is that when he does get his opportunities with the basketball, that he can put the ball through the net. We know as Gonzaga fans that he's capable of doing that because he was an excellent scorer in his couple of years in Spokane, but he hasn't really proven that anywhere else. He he was he struggled significantly in the summer league last year. I uh, got a few opportunities in the NBA, was very good with the Capital City Go-Go's, the G League affiliate for the Washington Wizards. I think he averaged like 11 points, six boards, five assists over there. So again, those are the kind of numbers that we expect from Joel that we know he's capable of doing, but we didn't see it here. We saw the the rebounds, we saw the assist numbers were good, but the the points per game just wasn't quite there. Uh, he played good defense. He only had three total turnovers. So again, he's not killing you on offense. He's not killing you on defense, but he's just not quite showing enough. He took nine three-pointers in those five games. So he only made two of them, and I'm not horribly concerned about the percentage. Again, nine shots is a really small sample, but that's kind of the problem. He played five games. He played 21 minutes per game. He took nine threes. You need to go find your shot. And I know that summer league is, is chaotic and that it's not as organized and that Joel is, is a player who really thrives in an organized system where he has a role. He has, you know, actions that he's supposed to be running, things he's supposed to be doing. That is where he thrives. Summer league is not that. So I'm not surprised that summer league isn't exactly conducive to Joel's skill set, but it's it's unfortunate because he needs to that this is where he needs to prove what he's capable of doing. Only taking nine threes in this opportunity, only knocking down two of them, is just hurting his ability to, to showcase what he can bring to an NBA roster. Uh, I think that that's, that's kind of where we're at with Joel. I think he's, I don't think he did enough in Summer League, frankly, to earn a two way contract or, or a regular NBA contract. I would be surprised if he got one of those. Wouldn't be shocked. He's very talented and don't think that he's undeserving of those things. Just would be surprised if he secured one. I think what's going to happen is the same thing that happened last year. He's going to kind of be on G League rosters and NBA teams are going to give him a look. But if he plays well in the G League, if he goes out, finds his shot, finds that outside shot, I think he absolutely has a chance to be an NBA player. Will he stick this season? Hard to say. That's best case scenario is yes. But I think he's absolutely going to get a look, multiple looks potentially at the NBA level this season. Finally, we'll finish up with Philip Petrusev. Of course, Petrusev, the 50th overall pick. In the 2021 NBA draft, after he left Gonzaga and played in Serbia for one season, he was the MVP in his league over there, averaged like 23 points per game, shot 42% from deep, was a completely different player than the player we had seen at Gonzaga. Even though he was really darn good at Gonzaga, he elevated his game entirely overseas, turned that into an NBA draft selection, but has not gotten a chance to stick in the NBA just yet. Played four games in the summer league this year, played about 12 minutes per game, five and a half points, 2.3 rebounds and one assist and one steal per game. Uh, he, he pretty much didn't do anything for the first few games of his summer league experience. He played five, six, seven minutes per game, uh, only had like two points per game, wasn't wasn't doing a whole lot of anything. His final game was his best opportunity. He got the chance to start and he took full advantage. He had 14 points on five of seven shooting, which is incredible. He was one of one from deep. That's what we needed to see. That's what we needed to see from Phil. He needs to show that he can be a low post score. He needs to show that he can be an outside shooter. This is, I mean, everybody, not just the guards, not just Nembhard, not just Joel, everybody. If you want to be an NBA player, you need to prove that you can shoot from the outside. And Philip Petrusev, he didn't do it at Gonzaga. He did it in his one year in Serbia. He didn't do it last year in Turkey. We, we, we haven't seen him do this enough to know that this is a skill set that he can he can provide in the NBA. And teams want to they want a big man who can come off the bench who can grab some grab them some rebounds, who can hold their own defensively, but who offensively can stretch the defense, pull the big man away from the rim, allow in this case, you know, James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, guys like that to get to the rim without there being somebody there to stop them. Phil hasn't shown that yet. I think he's capable of it. I think the year in Serbia proved that he can be that guy. But you have to prove it in front of the NBA scouts, in front of the general managers, in front of the teammates. you got to prove it in front of those guys. He just hasn't done that yet. Again, small sample. Summer League is – that's kind of the pain of Summer League in a lot of ways. Is It's a small sample. It's only a few games. There's a bunch of dudes who are playing for their careers. So everybody's trying to get theirs. Everybody's trying to get their shots up. 
make the highlight plays, do all of that. It's kind of a chaotic environment. I like it. It's fun. But I understand that for Gonzaga, for system guys, it can be a bit of a challenge. And we saw some guys struggle a little bit with this. Joel was probably the biggest loser in that regard in the last couple of summer leagues. But it didn't particularly help Petrusev either. And right now where I'm at with him, He's not. I don't think Philadelphia's going to sign, going to put him on the roster this year. They still have his rights. So if he were to go back and play overseas in Turkey, he would still be or anywhere. I don't know if it would be Turkey or not. But if he were to go back overseas and play, Philadelphia would still retain his rights. They would still be able to bring him over. They would still be the NBA team that he would play for. But I don't know if there's not really an opening on that roster right now. So unless there's some injuries, some uh, roster cuts, some moves that they make, I, I think he's probably going to spend this next season once again back in Europe. All right, third segment, we are discussing the collapse of the Pac-12 Big 12 merger, what it means for the Pac-12 conference, what it means for the ACC potentially, and of course what it means for Gonzaga. But before we get there, let's talk about bet online. College basketball may be deep into the offseason, but the MLB, WNBA, and MLS seasons are heating up into the summer months. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline remains the best spot for all the latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews for all of the leagues this season. And it's not just basketball. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering information needs, including live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. They have lines for coaching changes across every major sport, so even in the offseason, you can get your fix. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet online where the game starts. All right, segment three. Still, Andy Patton still locked on Zags. Talking Pac-12 and, of course, conference realignment. Once again, the talk of the offseason so far hasn't directly impacted Gonzaga yet, but it's been something that has been on the radar for a long time for Gonzaga. Are they going to look to the Big East? Are they going to look to the Mountain West? Are they going to see if there are other opportunities for them out there? Then, of course, you know, about a month ago, not even a month ago, a couple of weeks ago, the UC, UCLA and USC both absconded from the Pac-12, decided, hey, we're joining the Big Ten. We're getting a bigger piece of the pie media rights wise. They're going to make a hundred million more dollars or so bringing the L.A. market to the Big Ten, really hamstringing the Pac-12. Up to this point, the Pac-12, nothing else has happened. This is the only thing that has happened. There's been speculation running rampant. The Pac-12 is going to dissolve. The Pac-12 is going to merge with the Big Ten, with the Big 12, with the ACC. Every every conference, they're going to pull Mountain West schools. We're going to see the Big 12 take Arizona, Colorado, Utah. Like there's been there's been everything, everything that has been out there. But so far, nothing has happened. Now, one thing that recently came out, according to Pete Thamel, the merger, the proposed merger between the Pac-12 and the Big 12 is not happening. They had meetings, they had Zoom meetings, which was a source of contention on whether those kind of meetings should happen on Zoom. I'm not going to get into that, but it was a part of the conversation. Um, and the Big 12 effectively didn't find the Pac-12 lucrative enough. It didn't make sense financially. The, the Pac-12 obviously has a, has a lot of good media markets. They have Seattle, they have Phoenix, they have Salt Lake City, they have Denver, but they lost LA. That's, that's a big one. That's a very big one to lose. And there just isn't enough financial incentive for the Big 12 to really consider this. Now, the Big 12 could still attempt to poach. And I think that that's what's going to happen is they're going to say, well, we're not really interested in a full on merger. But those schools that we used to have, the one in Colorado, the one in Utah, those two in Arizona, like we might we might be taking those. Uh, and that would be bad news for the for the Pac-12. The Pac-12 has come out and has been very clear. Hey, we are hoping our plan is that the 10 schools that are still here are here. They're not going anywhere. Now, is that Oregon's plan? Probably not. Is that Washington's plan? Probably not. Is that Arizona, Colorado, Arizona State, and Utah's plan? I don't know. Uh, the Pac-12 is in immediate negotiations with new partnerships, TV partnerships. They're talking to ESPN. It hasn't been ex explicitly stated, but they're talking to ESPN. They're trying to negotiate a new deal with ESPN. ESPN has wants to have more of a foothold in the Pacific Northwest, in the Pacific time zone. This is very important to them. And so that's kind of where we're at. It, it, can the Pac-12 get a deal with ESPN where they can have a, a bigger piece of the pie financially? They can make more money. Their institutions will be like, okay, maybe we're not going to rush our way into the Big Ten. Maybe we'll stick this out here. Maybe we'll see how this works for us. Now, that doesn't mean that it's over. In fact, 
John Kinzano, the phenomenal reporter. He used to be at the Oregonian. Now he has his own site. Own site. Check it out if you haven't yet. It's just bald faced truth. John Kinzano did a really good piece recently about what this means. He has continued to bang the drum for the Pac 12 doing a soft merger with the ACC. That's pretty interesting. ACC, of course, is a not a huge powerhouse in football. Clemson really carries them in football, but they're a very big basketball conference. Duke and North Carolina obviously being the two programs that really drive it home for the ACC. But a Pac-12 ACC merger, it's a soft merger. Again, they're not going to just be constantly playing each other from a travel perspective. That doesn't make sense. Gonzano mentioned it could just be as simple as the Pac-12 champion plays the ACC champion in football, and then they have some like – dedicated games between the two of them, even from a basketball perspective, he specifically mentioned like Arizona and Duke, which those two teams agreed to play each other in a home and home series for the next couple of years. That was big news that came out on Monday afternoon. It could be relevant. That could be pretty relevant to these PAC 12 ACC conversations. If Arizona and Duke are playing each other every year and you get, you know, North Carolina and Oregon are playing each other every year. And all of a sudden you have this PAC 12 ACC kind of basketball powerhouse merger. Where does Gonzaga fit in? Do they fit in at all? Could they be in this conversation? Kinzano mentioned in his article that Gonzaga could, or excuse, Gonzaga, the Pac-12 could try to pull some of the Big 12's lower, pro- if the Big 12's going to go after Arizona's, could the Pac-12 try to steal some of their schools back? TCU was mentioned, Houston was mentioned, Baylor was mentioned, and then Kansas. Kansas is a bad football program. Capital B bad football program. They're they're not doing anything with the football program. And they rank as one of the lower tier power five programs because of that. But they're a basketball powerhouse. They are the defending national champions for the upcoming season. Like this is a very, very good basketball program. If the Pac-12 is like, well, you know, the football deals are going to be tough. The Big 12 doesn't want anything to do with us. They're going to try to take some of our schools. Can we try to merge with the ACC, have some kind of you know, commitment with them where we're getting, you know, we're getting to see Duke, we're getting to see North Carolina. And then could we parlay that into pulling Kansas away from the Big 12, adding them to our conference? If any of these things happen and all of a sudden the Pac-12 is starting to look like a legitimate basketball powerhouse, they have to entertain the idea of putting Gonzaga in the conference. They have to. They have to. Now, I still am I'm hesitant. The Pac-12 has not wavered one iota on their belief that the institutions in the PAC 12 should be big academic research institutions, which just eliminates Gonzaga entirely. That is not what Gonzaga is. The UW, Oregon, all those schools are 40,000 plus people. They have these huge research institutions. They're publicly funded schools. That's not the case with Gonzaga. Gonzaga is a 10th of the size of those schools. It's in a much smaller media market in Spokane. It does not have a football program, which has never been explicitly stated as a requirement to be in the Pac-12, but it is at this point. It has always been the case. So I still think that they're, that the Pac-12 is probably not super seriously entertaining this. But if they're running the risk of losing some of their programs to the Big 12, or if Oregon and Washington are still really considering jumping to the Big 10, which I have no reason to believe that they're not. And the Pac-12 starts to look towards, hey, how can we you know, get ESPN involved? How can we get the ACC involved where we're going to have these t- primetime basketball games happening on the West Coast? You have to consider it. And ESPN loves Gonzaga. I, they love Gonzaga. They put as many Gonzaga games as possible on TV. Their broadcasters are, I mean, they have freaking sandwiches named after them at the Davenport in Spokane. ESPN loves Gonzaga. And if the Pac-12 is exclusively negotiating with ESPN to try to get rights, and they're looking at adding programs like Kansas and adding a partnership with the ACC to beef up their basketball, this is something that needs to be considered. Needs to be considered. Now, would this be more appealing to Gonzaga than the Big East? Hard to say, but my my inkling says yes. Obviously, if we're talking about a a Pac-12 that also includes Kansas and that includes games against Duke and North Carolina, then yes, absolutely. Uh, Then I don't think there's a debate at all. If Gonzaga gets the opportunity to play Arizona and Oregon and Washington and Washington State and Cal and Stanford, which are, are good quality programs, but they also get to play Kansas They also get to play maybe Houston if they were to somehow get pulled into the Pac-12 and you get this soft merger. I don't know the exact details of what it would look like, but potential opportunities to play Duke or North Carolina or even, you know, Clemson, Florida State, some of the other programs in the ACC, Notre Dame. That's huge. That's huge, huge, huge. Again, Gonzaga still doesn't fit. 
They don't look like the other Pac-12 schools. They don't have the same size. They don't have the same media market. They don't have a football program. I'm still not sure that all of that is enough to overcome for the Pac-12 to extend them an invite. But this ESPN conversation, this ACC merger conversation, these conversations about Kansas, all of this point to a potential situation where the Pac-12 is heavily involved in building a basketball powerhouse conference on the West Coast with a media network that already loves Gonzaga. It's hard not to look at those pieces and think, hey, there's maybe a way that this all fits together uh, in a way that's conducive to Gonzaga potentially joining the Pac-12, having a much, much better conference schedule, having a bunch of games on ESPN, and getting to play some of the really big boys every single season. We're going to have way more on this as it continues to develop. Uh, obviously, there's still a ton of pieces that need to get put together for anything to happen here. Uh, but that is going to do it for me today. Don't forget to check out the new website for written content, scorezagscore.com. Check it out. I, get, I got a facelift recently. It looks brand new. Lots of content there, three to four articles per day. Uh, we got a lot more good content coming out here on Locked on Zags this week. We're going to talk about Malachi Smith, what he brings to the table. We're going to talk about the basketball tournament. All sorts of fun stuff right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube as well. Finally, thank you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. Locked On WCC doesn't exist yet, but you can get more informed on the West Coast happenings and potential merger conversations by making Locked On Pac-12 your second listen of the day. Host Spencer McLaughlin and the local experts of Locked On take you across the Pac-12 in 30 minutes, five times per week. All right, thank you all for listening and go Zags.